Friday, March 26, 2004, in Lanau, about 50 kilometers from Dijon. It is 11.35 a.m. when Laurent Barry, a 35-year-old poultry breeder, calls 911. He sounds shocked. He tells them that when he came home, he found his wife Valerie lying in her blood, dead. When Laurent Barry calls 911, he is very upset. He's freaking out. It's a totally panicked man they're talking to. He keeps yelling on the phone. He's calling for help. He's traumatized. He yells that his wife is unconscious, that she's dying. Then he yells that she died, that he doesn't know where his dogs are. He's completely stressed out and distraught. Dijon's firemen quickly arrive with an emergency doctor and a police squad from Puy en auxois a town close by. When the police arrive, they find Laurent Barry outside his home in a state of shock. He's not moving and his hands are covered with blood. He can't speak clearly. He talks about his dogs. He doesn't know where they are. He's in such a state of shock that they have to send him to the hospital in Dijon. The emergency doctor certifies Valerie Barry's death and finds that the 38-year-old woman has been stabbed many times. The Dijon Criminal Police Unit is put in charge of the investigation. When they arrive, the detectives immediately freeze the crime scene while they wait for Jean-Claude Dumaret, Dijon's assistant district attorney. I saw the victim lying on the ground. She was wearing pants and a sweatshirt. Her legs were spread out. Her upper body was a bit bent. Valerie Barry's body is lying in blood. Her head in particular is in a real pool of blood. They can see a huge wound on her neck. The vice prosecutor is immediately intrigued by the crime scene. What immediately struck me was the blood puddle on the ground. It looked like she had been moved during her agony. Getting closer to the body, the police find an essential clue for the investigation. Next to Valerie Barry's body, the detectives find a large kitchen knife with a bloody blade. That knife, probably the murder weapon, is sent out for tests. Next to the body, they also find one of the victim's slippers. Inside the kitchen that is in the next room, they find her second slipper. But there is more. In the kitchen, the detectives find two more blood stains on the floor. The blood is immediately collected to be sent for analysis while the police try to assess the crime sequence of events. They start wondering whether the body might have been dragged on the floor. They wonder if there has been some struggle that might have started in the kitchen and ended up in the living room. They start wondering about all those questions. They are also stricken by the fact that the house is in total disarray. That's the first thing you see. There are objects everywhere, and many drawers are wide open. Then they find her purse upside down. In the bedroom, they find her jewelry box upside down on the bed. The closets have been emptied. They start thinking it could have been a burglary. The house is meticulously searched for fingerprints. In the victim's husband's office, inside a coin box covered in dust, they can clearly find one. They take a picture of the box and add it to the list of evidence. The possibility of a burglary seems to be getting confirmed. 
At 4 p.m., the coroner arrives. The coroner observes the wounds on the victim's neck, the bruises and hematomas on her hands, but above all, he sees some cuts at the tips of her fingers. That proves she tried to defend herself, to push her attacker away. There has been a struggle between her and the attacker before he took over, unfortunately. When the coroner and the CSI technicians described to me the nature of the wounds, I immediately feel like we are not in front of something ordinary. On the victim's left hand, the coroner finds four hairs. They are immediately sent to the lab for a DNA test. After the initial observations, Valerie Barry is sent to the Dijon Forensic Institute to be autopsied, while a criminal investigation for first-degree murder is launched. A few hours later, Laurent Barry, the victim's husband, is still in shock. But the procedure requires him to go through a medical exam in front of the police. Because she had been fighting for her life, they start by looking at the husband's hands to look for scratches or bruises. They find absolutely nothing. The detectives ask to look under Mr. Barry's nails to see if they find some of his wife's DNA underneath. Waiting for the results, the husband is questioned as a simple witness about his schedule and that of his wife's during that day. That morning, Valerie Barry wasn't working. She wanted to smooth the rough edges of their dining room's beams. They lived in an old farm that was being remodeled. Laurent Barry said he left Lano with his wife's car around 9 a.m. Laurent Barry breeds poultry. On the morning of the murder, around 9 a.m., he was on his way to deliver some chickens to a restaurant in Dijon. He says that before leaving, he weighed the poultries and prepared the bill accordingly. He says he arrived in Dijon around 10 a.m. Then he went to visit a friend in his garage. He got there around 10.30 and left around 11 a.m. and got home around 11.30 a.m. Laurent Barry tells the detectives that something struck him when he came back home. His dogs were missing from the house. Usually, the dogs are always running around in front and around the house. That day, the dogs were missing. His dog's absence is very suspicious to him because he's so used to finding them greeting him when he arrives. He starts worrying about them. When he enters the house, he says he found his wife's body lying in a pool of blood. He doesn't say anything else. Although the hypothesis of a robbery gone wrong seems very likely, the detectives want to check every possible option. They will check Laurent Barry's statement while his clothes are sent to the lab for analysis. Then, the day after the murder, Laurent Barry calls the police station to let them know that some things went missing at his place. Laurent Barry tells the detectives that someone stole his watch that was in a bag in the truck as well as a hundred euros that were under the money box. This seems to confirm the scenario of a robbery. The detectives really need the results of the autopsy to figure out the circumstances of the murder. According to the corpse rigidness, the coroners estimate the time of death between 9.45 and 11.30 on March 26, 2004. The coroner then lists the several stab wounds on the victim's body. He starts with a very deep wound on her neck, a slit on her face, and five cuts on the top of her head. But there is more. On top of those, there are other far more dangerous wounds particularly the thorax wounds on the left side and one on the back. 
She was stabbed very violently because the blade went all the way up to the carotid artery and cut it. The blow was violent because it takes some strength not only to cross the skin and the muscles to the artery, but also to break a vertebrae which is a very resistant bone. The shape of the wounds reveals more about the murder weapon. All the wounds found on Valerie Barry's body are compatible with a knife found on the crime scene. The blade is a very long, pointy and strong one. It could very well have been used to make that kind of wounds. In total, the victim was stabbed 13 times. But the internal exam of the body reveals more wounds. There's evidence she had been hit with a blunt object. One especially violent blow around the left temple. We can say it's violent because it provoked very complex fractures on the skull's basis, despite that part of the skull being very deep and very resistant. Those fractures really show a very violent impact. Death was caused by the combination of that punch, which provoked a serious head trauma, and the many knife wounds she endured. There is no specific deadly element. It really is all the violent punches and stabbing together that caused her death. Crossing the autopsy results with their observations from the crime scene, the detectives come up with an initial scenario. We can imagine that an argument started in the kitchen, then both people moved to the living room. There, I imagine, the first violent blow was the one on her back. Valerie Berry does the best she can to protect herself. Then she is hit many times, which would explain the scratches on her fingers. And finally, one last violent punch to her left temple that makes her fall to the ground. The number of times she was stabbed exposes the murderer's psychological state. Usually, we have one or two knife wounds that unfortunately reach vital organs, and that is why the victim dies. But here, there are a lot of them, which shows perseverance. We can feel anger and rage here. We can easily imagine the expression of a repressed rage here. So animated by a blind rage, the murderer would have taken it all out on Valerie Barry. The detectives start wondering how a burglar could be so mad at a victim to stab her 13 times. What if the murderer was actually someone Valerie Barry knew? They start looking into if she might have had an affair. They try to understand if a relative could have ended up doing this to her. Valerie Barry is a 38-year-old nursing assistant who really loves her work. She is described as a radiant woman. Valerie Barry's colleagues describe her as very nice, fun, and warm. She seems like she was a perfect woman who really loved her work. Valerie's mother-in-law also describes her as a sincere and generous woman. Valerie was amazing. We got along really well. She had character. I mean, if she had something to tell you, she would do so. But she was like that. 
And she was a really good woman. When she meets Laurent back in 1997, Valerie already had a seven-year-old son. Laurent, also separated, already has two kids by now, a four-year-old and a five-year-old. Valerie is a very attractive girl and Laurent falls deeply in love with her. He will try everything in order to seduce her. He leaves flowers on her car, things like that, and Valerie quickly falls for him as well. Between them, it is love at first sight, and only one year after they first met, Valerie and Laurent decide to get married. Their wedding was wonderful. They got married in the village. For us, it meant we would have some more grandchildren, because usually when you get married, it's to start a family. They were very beautiful together. The following year, they have a little girl. A new life is starting for this large, modern family. Valérie Barry is an ordinary woman, no enemies, no lover. Of course, the detectives investigate those possibilities, but they don't find anything. Still convinced a relative was involved, the police decide to question the husband again. First, they ask him about the murder weapon. He immediately tells them that the knife belongs to him. He tells them the knife was usually on the kitchen window because his wife kept complaining she didn't have a good knife to cook with. So she would use it daily in the kitchen when she needed it. He told them about the kitchen window as if to explain how easy it would have been to pick up the knife. The detectives check Lauren Barry's alibi. According to the coroner, Valerie Barry's death happened between 9.45 and 11.30 a.m. at a time when her husband was in Dijon, 55 kilometers away from their house. At the restaurant, they tell the police that Laurent Barry delivered his chickens between 10 and 10.15 a.m. His mechanic friend tells them he came over right after that. They all confirm Laurent Barry's statement about his schedule for that morning. The mechanic confirms Laurent Barry left Dijon around 11 a.m. There is no way he could have returned home before 11.30. In other words, he cannot be his wife's murderer. With no suspect in sight yet, the investigators keep looking into Valerie Barry's relatives. That's how they find out that a few days before she died, the young woman was under duress. One of her colleagues says she was a bit upset the day before she died. Mr. Barry's children tell the police she wouldn't let them go out alone the previous weekend, and that she felt safer when Mr. Barry came home. They could tell she was worried about something. Apparently, she had been complaining about someone who was trying to seduce her without saying who it was. That means she was scared of someone. As the hearings go on, the robbery gone wrong hypothesis seems less and less credible. Indeed, since the first day, one detail in the crime scene had caught their attention. Some piles of clothes had been put on the bed and the furniture. A burglar doesn't proceed this way. He always looks in between the clothes. He carefully searches everywhere and leaves a mess behind himself. The jewelry box had also alerted the detectives. It looked like it was simply thrown on the bed. It looks like the search hadn't been that extensive. They quickly thought of a fake robbery. Why would someone have tried to rob a pretty modest house? It's the first house you see from the road, when a bit further there are the fancier houses. That would make more sense for a robbery. Also, it's surprising that the robbery would have happened in the middle of the morning and not at night. The time of the crime is actually very strange, too. There is no sign of break-in. Another intriguing thing are the dogs. 
They were found locked away in one of the farm sheds the day of the drama. Laurambari said when he left that morning, they were running around in the garden. And he adds that only someone they knew could have managed to lock them up. Both dogs are pretty aggressive. They are impressive guard dogs. Even his wife couldn't really boss them around. In the crime scene, I had ordered a veterinary expertise and some toxicological tests to figure out whether the dogs had been drugged. The tests revealed nothing. So they were there, which means it couldn't have been just anybody. The murderer had to know the dogs to manage to get in and kill Valerie Barry. With his wife. Out of the blue, from one day to the next, his wife didn't want to see that man anymore. When he came over, she would run away to the kitchen. She wanted absolutely no contact with him. He thought probably the man didn't behave properly with her, that she sent him packing and didn't want to see him again. According to Lauren Barry, his business partner had tried to seduce his wife, but there is more. Money issues had put an end to the two men's partnership. They disagree because the new partner wants 50% of the business, but Mr. Barry refuses to give him 50% since he's the one providing the location, the equipment, the tools, so they disagree on their shares. Nine months before the murder, the two men stopped seeing each other indefinitely. One important detail stands out. Lauren Barry tells the police his former business partner knew his wife would be alone that morning. He tells the detectives, he knew perfectly well that every Friday morning I deliver chicken in Dijon. He knew I wasn't there. Did he come over to my house to try to seduce my wife and things got ugly? Lauren Barry tells them the man could get in the house very easily. Aside from the couple, he was the only person who knew the dogs very well. The dogs knew him really well too, so he could totally have locked them up. There is another detail about the murder weapon. That man knows really well that that knife is always in the kitchen window. He could easily have picked it up. Intrigued by all these elements, the police decide to question the former business partner. The detectives question the former business partner. He stays pretty vague about his schedule. He says he went to his parents that morning. He says he got there around 10.30. The man says he spent the night at his ex-girlfriend's, but remains vague about the time he left her place. When questioned, the ex-girlfriend tells the detectives he left pretty early that morning, but she also gives them a pretty surprising piece of information. The man's ex-girlfriend tells the police that the day he heard about Mrs. Barry's death, the man got really upset, saying he didn't have an alibi. After being questioned, the former business partner is considered irrelevant for the case. They won't check anything, even though there are some contradictions. He left very early. Where did he go? We know nothing. Nothing is checked. I think they decided not to follow the lead of the former business partner. They quickly put it aside, saying that his relationship with Mrs. Barry couldn't justify such a crime. The main thing the detectives focused on while questioning that man was his description of his former partner, Lauren Barry. He tells them horrible things about Mr. Barry, like the fact that he would have told him that when he was in the army, he used to love the smell of blood and powder. He describes him as an extremely violent man, but he also says the couple was going through a really rough patch. He says they didn't get along anymore. He says Mrs. Barry was fed up with their life in the countryside, that she didn't like it. Mr. 
le fait que Because it was Laurent who mentioned that man to the detectives, it will end up playing against him. Because his former partner is the one that will put the detectives on Laurent's trail. The detectives then focus on the relationship between Valerie Barry and her husband. From one testimony to the next, they find out that a few months before the woman's death, the couple had been through a serious crisis. Since the 2003 heat wave, Laurent Barry's business wasn't as profitable anymore. He had lost many of his chickens. So what happened? Basically, Valerie was the breadwinner. The whole family was living on her assistant nurse salary. The young and beautiful woman got tired of living modestly. Apparently, they were also close to bankruptcy, which didn't ease the tensions at home. Three months prior to the murder, the couple seemed to have reached their breaking point. It was so bad that at the end of 2003, for a whole week, Laurent Barry slept in his truck. When at the same time, Valerie had called a real estate agent to find an apartment. She was planning to move out and break up with Laurent Barry. But according to Laurent Barry's mother, the couple had managed to overcome that crisis and salvage their marriage. It's true. Back in the end of November or the beginning of December, they had a really dark phase. But on New Year's Eve, my grandchildren were with them, and they were already back to kissing each other. Everything was back to normal. We were relieved to see them in love again. Even the kids were happy. Laurent was aware the couple was going through a rough patch, but after a while, things had gotten better. They had found their balance again. And yet, the police still believe they are on the right track. There had been rumors of divorce, a breakup, then some kind of reconciliation during a family meal. But when the discord is real, we all know this is only temporary. Money issues, discord, all this must have built the right atmosphere for such a drama. While following the passion murder lead, the police receive the results of the DNA test. They first focus on the murder weapon. Valerie Barry's DNA was found on the blade, but on the handle, no DNA was found. Maybe the murderer was wearing gloves, or maybe the handle was cleaned. Another reason could be that blood from the blade leaked on the handle and covered it. Because it's a lot of blood, the victim's DNA covers up any other DNA, even if someone else's DNA is indeed there. The DNA test verified the blood found in the kitchen are the victims meaning she was probably attacked there. Of the four hairs found on her hand, only one could be tested. Of those four hairs, only one had a bulb. You need hair with a bulb to get the sufficient amount of DNA to identify a person. Unfortunately, in this case, there wasn't enough DNA. We couldn't, from this piece of evidence, come up with a genetic profile that could have led us to the murderer. The bulb tests lead nowhere, but the experts try testing the hair anyway. Oh, the bulb tests. We looked for another kind of DNA, the mitochondrial DNA. It is a less precise kind because it will identify anyone with the same motherhood lineage. That allowed us to conclude that the hair either came from the victim or from someone related to her on her mother's side, either her kids or her mother herself. 
that hair could have belonged to Valerie Barry herself. The experts decide without testing them that all the other hair belonged to her as well. They considered that those hairs glued to her hand, dark blonde, had to be hers and that no further analyses were necessary. But the detectives mostly focus on other details. The test results from under Lauren Barry's nails shows the presence of his wife's DNA, as well as on the collar of the shirt he was wearing that day. But those elements don't prove his guilt. He didn't deny that when he found his wife, the firemen asked him if she was still breathing. He told them he bent over her. That means he touched her after the crime. It is thus totally normal to find his wife's DNA under his nails or on his clothes. If I touch someone as they're dying, I will eventually get the person's blood on my hands. If I analyze what's under my nails, I will probably find that blood that may have arrived there after the murder and not during it. The detectives decide to run another search of the couple's house, hoping to find new clues. When searching Valerie Barry's car, they find her husband's slippers, and one of them has blood on it. Laurent Barry. Laurent Barry tells them the slippers are in the car because since the crime, he's been living at his parents' place, and he was going to bring the slippers over there. The slippers are immediately sent in to lab testing. The results are very clear. The blood found on the slipper belongs to Valerie Barry. The detectives now think Laurent was wearing the slippers when he killed Valerie. More than ever, Laurent Barry seems to be the number one suspect, especially since no evidence shows anybody else's DNA found on the crime scene. If this proves one thing, it is that there never was any so-called murder involved. I'm not surprised. If the murderer was a bit careful, it's totally possible he didn't leave any DNA or fingerprints. But that doesn't mean Mr. Barry had to be the assassin. At this stage, the police don't have any formal evidence of Lauren Barry's guilt. Looking for the tiniest clue, they decide to go back to the beginning and listen again to the recording of the phone call he made to 911 when he found his wife's body. They listen to his desperate call to 911. He was pretty incoherent. He said, where are the dogs? Where are the dogs? When in the background, you could hear the dogs barking. After listening to that phone call, the police realizes one would totally hear the dogs barking, which means Lauren Barry was close by to the dogs when he called 911. They thought if he lied about the dogs, that means he may have lied about everything else. But suddenly, a new testimony makes the detectives question themselves. A month after the facts, a new stand owner spontaneously shows up at the police station. She tells them that one morning, a man asked her for the paper. He seemed very interested in the Valerie Barry case. She tells them this happened only three days after the murder, and she recalls the man really wanted to know if it was in the papers. She also noticed that the man had been bitten on the hand. That bite looked like a human bite, which intrigued her. The police show her Lauren Barry's picture, but she is positively sure that this man isn't her mysterious client. That lead will go nowhere because she is incapable of giving them a precise description of that person. The detectives decide not to follow that lead. For the next 10 months, the investigation is in a dead end until new results arrive. They come from an essential piece of evidence from the crime scene, the money box found on Lauren Barry's desk. 
the one that had 100 euros underneath before the crime. According to the experts, the fingerprint found on that dusty object belongs to Lauren Barry's right thumb. That fingerprint contains sweat, fat, and amino acids, so it's humid. And that's why it will make such a clear mark on the dust covering the object. But there is more. The experts managed to find two more fingerprints that weren't visible to the naked eye. They matched Lauren Barry's thumb and left annular. We have two fingerprints that we call simultaneous, meaning that they belong to fingers of a same hand. So, automatically, we're lucky, because since they belong to the same hand, you can't find them fortuitously. And I repeat, they belong to the same hand. Lauren Barry seems now to be the only one to have touched the dusty money box unless the murderer had been wearing gloves. Let's assume that he was wearing gloves. In that case, the object being dusty, we would have found traces left by the gloves. The only relevant conclusion is that the fingerprints from the money box all belonged to Mr. Laurent Berry. We can say for sure that he is the only person to have touched that object that day. At that moment, the detectives believed that he was the one to take the 100 euros, that they hadn't been stolen. The fingerprints found on the money box only confirm what the detectives already believed. From the beginning, they had believed that the robbery had been staged to cover the murderer's tracks. They also believe Lauren Barry could be the one who set it all up. And actually, new evidence that had come in contradicts the suspect's alibi. His major alibi is to say he wasn't there because he was delivering his chickens and visiting a friend. When Laurent Barry gave them his schedule, he mentioned he had prepared the invoices on that very morning. When they go through his computer, they realize those invoices hadn't been edited on the morning, but the night before, at midnight. If the invoices were created the night before, that gives him more time, because in order to prepare the invoices, he needed to weigh the chickens, which takes a little time. They started thinking this gave him enough time to kill his wife that morning. They then start checking other parts of his schedule. Suddenly, Laurent Barry's alibi is seriously shaken. Laurent Barry told them it took him about an hour to get to Dijon. The detectives will drive there and time the duration of the drive. It takes them 40 minutes. What will they conclude? That Laurent Barry left Lano a lot later than he told them, not at 9, but closer to 9.30 a.m. To be in Dijon around 10 or 10.15 a.m., Laurent Barry left his house not at 9 a.m., like he said he did, but at 9.30. But the coroner had said that Valerie Barry's death couldn't have occurred before 9.45 a.m. The coroner has an explanation. The victim might have agonized for 10 minutes before dying, which means the struggle could have occurred around 9.30 when Lauren Barry was still there. The recreation of the drive to Dijon is a serious clue against Laurent Barry. It proves he could totally have killed his wife before leaving the house. Almost two years after the crime, Lauren Barry is put in custody on January 17, 2006. The police strongly believe Lauren Barry killed his wife, while the man keeps denying it. Still looking for evidence, the detective starts searching his parents' house, where he has been living since the murder. In a box, they discover a major piece of evidence. They find the expensive watch the man had declared stolen at the beginning of the investigation. Asked about it, the suspect has an explanation. 
Laurent picked up his stuff so quickly to come here. He didn't really pay attention. It's only after he moved in that we found his watch. He thought the watch was gone. When he finds it, he doesn't notify the police. When the detectives find his watch, it puts him even more on the spot. A setup robbery, a money box touched only by Laurent Barry, and a watch that was never stolen. For the detectives, Lauren Barry is obviously the murderer. One last thing, though, the dogs. When he called 911, LB told them he was desperately looking for them. But on the recording of that phone call, you can clearly hear the dogs barking. When questioned about that contradiction, the man suddenly changed his statement. He tells the police he's the one who locked the dogs up before leaving that morning because his wife didn't want to be bothered by them while working on the living room's beams. She had asked him to lock them up. Lauren Barry tries to justify this new lie. Lauren Barry tells them he was in such a shock he simply forgot that he had locked the dogs up. From my experience with people confronted to a crime scene, especially with relatives, when you are in such a big state of shock, looking at your wife's blood pool, you do not see anything else. You can't think of anything else. You can't even remember your name. It's totally normal. If he really was the one who killed his wife, calling 911 while organizing his defense, I really can't see why he would say his dogs were missing when you could clearly hear them in the background. But the detectives are still convinced he is guilty. Still in custody, a pressured Lauren Barry will finally confess he was the one who staged the robbery because he was afraid he would be accused of his wife's murder. Mr. Barry told me he had a really bad relationship with his father-in-law, Valerie's father. He was sure that man would immediately accuse him. He panicked. He thought, they will point their finger at me. So he turns her bag upside down. He throws the jewelry box on the bed. He tried to set up a robbery because he was panicking. He really lost it. He thought that as a former paratrooper, a chicken killer, he would immediately be suspected. And in the end, that's exactly what happened. I think his biggest mistake was to set up the robbery. He really shouldn't have done that. All the lies, all the many clumsy lies that should have been just lies end up being considered as evidence of his guilt. Laurent Barry also confesses that that morning he had a fight with his wife. The detectives don't doubt his culpability anymore. The detectives think they're watching a family drama. Their marriage was broken and that was it. At the end of his custody, Lauren Barry is charged with first degree murder and sent to jail. A few months later, his lawyer manages to bail him out. She argues about one piece of evidence in the case that was never covered by the investigation, the couple's truck. That vehicle, stationed in front of the Barry's farm that morning, had been moved. From the neighbors and passers-by statements, we can figure out that at 8 a.m. the truck was parked with its front facing the street. Then around 11.15, when the mail delivery woman passes by the Barry's house, she says she noticed the truck was parked with its front facing the house. One detail seems to indicate that Valerie Barry was the one who used that truck. We know that when she was the one parking the truck, she would always park it with its front facing the house because she couldn't see very well. The windshield was a bit dirty. She couldn't see through it very well. So she would just park straight without making a U-turn. That is an essential piece of information. 
Madame Barry apparently used the vehicle that morning to go buy some things for the beams. The day before, she had been in touch with a hardware store. She probably needed something, and she drove to buy it, which proves that after her husband left, Miss Barry was still alive. In December 2006, 11 months after being sent to jail, Lauren Barry is free to go, but he is still accused of murder. Three years later, in October 2009, his trial starts at the Dijon Criminal Court of Justice. He arrived in court relatively confident, thinking that if they had set him free, that meant they thought he was innocent. And yet, after the deliberations, the jury sentences Lauren Barry to 20 years in prison for the murder of his wife. A few months later, this sentence is appealed. While hearing a sentence, he didn't say a word. He had only said three words before the jury's deliberation. I am innocent. It was really inexplicable. We were very disappointed. And very angry. But at the same time, we wanted to keep fighting to get him out of there. From his cell, Laurent Barry keeps claiming that it was a judicial mistake. His family then hired two private investigators, Roger Marc Moreau and Sabrina Hamoudi. Monsieur Barry's sentence was final. He claims his innocence. They ask for my opinion. Is there a way to support this case? In January 2013, a counter-investigation starts with Sylvie Noakovic's support. The lawyers want a revision of his trial. They came to me because of my expertise in criminal law, and especially with judicial errors. Reading that case, I was immediately aware of the uncertainties, the inconsistencies, and the negligence it showed. Lauren Barry's defense points out a fundamental mistake which really impacted the investigation. They sealed the house for 24 hours. 24 hours later, they told Mr. Barry and his mom, you can clean everything up, that's not a problem. They immediately cleaned everything up. The crime scene was searched only one time, the day of the drama, during the first observations. Because it was cleaned up so fast, they couldn't come back to search for more DNA traces somewhere else or any other clues that could have proven Mr. Barry to be innocent of his wife's murder. The house cleaning also invalidates one piece of evidence against Lauren Barry, the slipper found in the car 11 days after the crime with his wife's bloodstain. It was actually Lauren's mother who wore that slipper while cleaning the house. To clean the house, I put on the first pair of slippers I found. They were my son's. I put on my son's slippers. There was blood all over the room, so it's only normal that they would find the victim's blood. Very little blood, actually, on the sole of the slipper. The private investigators find another problem with the case. The 40 minutes timing from Lano to Dijon measured by the police. According to the investigators, that timing was the proof that Lauren Barry had the time to kill his wife before driving to Dijon. The police forgot to time the loading, the unloading, and the delivery in their 40 minutes. They only timed the driving. The whole delivery would have been impossible to carry out in only 40 minutes. Something much easier could have been done to figure out where LB was and at what time he should have come. The police could have simply located him using a cell phone, but that was not the case, which doesn't make sense. I think this is very suspicious. The counter-investigation also reveals the fact that one lead wasn't exploited enough. 
Lauren Barry's former business partner lead. His girlfriend said that he had left early that morning. We don't know what that means exactly. He said he'd gotten up at 9 a.m. and left around 10 a.m. for his father's place. So that's not early. It's contradictory. The second thing is that they never checked his statement. They never tracked his cell phone. They never asked him any further questions about it. When she reads the official report from the former partner's hearing, Ms. Novakovic is surprised when she sees how many times he accuses Lauren Barry for the crime. The former partner's statement is so strongly accusing the husband, it loses all credibility. The police should have wondered, why on earth is he accusing Mr. Barry? They should have taken that question seriously. The private investigators and the lawyers are now convinced the police investigation made many mistakes, which led to Lauren Barry's unfair condemnation. Our objective in this case is to find the real murderer. As long as we can't do that, Mr. Barry will stay in jail which is very unfortunate, since he's always claimed he was innocent. Always. He still wants to keep fighting to prove his innocence. He's still hopeful. His hopefulness really helps his mother to hold on in what is a real ordeal. My only fight is to find out who did that, because my son spent years in prison for nothing. They threw his life away. They threw my grandchildren's lives away. None of us is alive right now. We are only surviving. We try to keep believing better days will come. We hang on for our grandchildren. But Laurent is our only child. I hope I will still be alive when he finally gets out. On the one side, a victim, Valerie Barry, who left a 14-year-old boy and a 5-year-old daughter. On the other side, a man behind bars, her husband, who keeps claiming his innocence. In between them, one hope, that eventually the truth will come out.